Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. For the first time since she became the center of a very heated national conversation on the meaning of what it is to be black, the former head of the Spokane NAACP, Rachel Dojel, a woman born to white parents but who identifies as black, is telling her side of the story in this exclusive interview with Melissa Harris Perry. I've heard a lot of people ask you the question, are you African American or Caucasian? I am not going to ask it that way. <laughs> right. Are you black? Yes. What do you mean when you say that? What, what does it mean to you to mm -hmm. assume the mantle, the identity of blackness? Well, it, it means several things. First of all, it means that I have really gone there with the experience in terms of being a mother of two black sons and um, really owning what it, what it means to experience and live black blackness and um, so that's one aspect another aspect would be that I as a, from a very young age felt a, I don't know if it's a spiritual visceral just very instinctual connection with um, black is beautiful um, you know just just the black experience and wanting to celebrate that and and I didn't know I didn't, how to articulate that as a young child I mean in, in kindergarten or whatever like you know you don't have words for what's going on but certainly that was that was shut down I mean I was socially conditioned to not own that mm -hmm. and to um, be be limited to to whatever biological identity was was thrust upon me and and narrated to me and and so I I kind of felt pretty awkward mm -hmm. a lot of times mm -hmm. with that and um, I remember when Larry Ruthann chose to to adopt um, my younger siblings and I n knowing some of the the resistance to just my independent spirit and creative ways that, that I wanted to express myself, I was, I felt like who is, who is gonna be the link for the ki kids in coming to the family? And um, I really felt like a mother sister to, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. so, so let me first start with the idea of being the parent of black children. So my mother is a white woman who interestingly grew up in Spokane, Washington, who's raised black children, mm -hmm. but she doesn't herself feel black, right? So she's a, she's a white woman doing the work of parenting black children. Help me to understand why you see a distinction between, on the one hand, being a white person, raising and rearing black children, whether those children are initially your siblings, or whether they're your bio children, or whether they're your adopted children, right? The, all the different ways we make family. Mm -hmm versus feeling in your own skin, in your own personhood, that you are yourself black. Right. I felt very isolated with my identity virtually my entire life, that, that nobody really got it, and that I didn't really have the personal agency to express it. Mm -hmm. And certainly I, I kind of imagined that maybe at some point, especially, you know, first or after the kids were graduated from high school and in their adult stride, um, that maybe I'd be able to really process that, own it publicly, and, and discuss this kind of complexity. But um, certainly, it, you know, I wasn't expecting it to be thrust upon me right now. So, when you talk about, when you respond to my question, mm -hmm. are you black? And your response is yes. There are listeners who are enraged. I understand. Not confused enraged and many of those listeners many of those observers who are angry are black women mm -hmm. can you understand that anger yes and I would say in an <laughs> stepping outside of myself I would probably be enraged I'd be mm -hmm. like what the you know this person how, how dare she mm -hmm. claim this but those they don't know me they really don't know what I've actually walked through and how hard it is. Um, this has not been something that just is, is a casual, you know, come and go sort of identity, you know, or an identity crisis or something's mm -hmm. gonna fade away. And people have asked like, so, you know, are you gonna go back to being white? Mm -hmm. um, if you're rejected by the black community, what do you do? Uh, I'll be me, I'll be me because, hmm. I, you know, I feel like 
At the same time, I never want to be a liability to the cause. Mm -hmm. And I take that very seriously in, in consideration. There's so much to, to just process with sort of going from being celebrated as a black woman and loving how that feels by all the students that I mentor and like feeling like, all right, I can, I can be me and they get me and I get them. And we talk about, you know, yeah, you know, just Iggy Azalea and cultural appropriation and all of these things, you know, we're, in, I teach race and culture classes. Mm -hmm. I teach black studies. I mm -hmm. teach black feminism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like so you have a to, so you have a critique this, of though. racial appropriation. Absolutely. Because you are currently being criticized for being a racial appropriator. Right, and I get it. I get it. In what ways have you profited directly from blackness, which is undoubtedly the question people are saying? Well, you took a job. How much do you get paid as the head of the NAACP of Spokane? Nothing. It's unpaid. In fact, the NAACP is a completely unpaid pos position or organization except for the national offices. Mm -hmm. So even the, the board of directors in the national level are unpaid. So it's, it's a volunteer position. And how much are you paid for your role on the police accountability board? Nothing. <laughs> when I asked you, are you black, and you affirm yes that you are, and you explain to me what blackness is, for many people, race, and, and I, for more people even than I expected, race is based in some set of biological realities right. and that it has everything to do with parentage. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the people who are your parents, who are you talking about? Well, if, if I'm talking about mom and dad, mm -hmm. I don't really have a, a mom figure mm -hmm. in my life right now. Um, I have a dad. And I've talked about him, and or or that's been that that, that was the the three second pause was when his picture was pulled out. Is this your father? Are you African American? Okay. I was wondering if uh, <laughs> if your dad really is an African American man. That's a very. I mean, I don't I don't know what you're implying. Are you African American? I don't I don't understand. The question. Are your parents, are they white? Everything from all the related in events flooded my mind. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, this is not about me. Now is the time for no comment because I need to step back mm -hmm. and see who's really going to be affected by what I say right now. And <clears throat> So I do acknowledge that the people that raised me are Larry and Ruthann. Mm -hmm. um, I do not feel like they are my mom and dad. And I do think that hopefully, uh, even if I'm you know, judged or, or you know, there's confusion and anger about how I identify, I hope that people can understand that family is fluid. Those same people probably have nephews, cousins, maybe have mm -hmm. um, somebody that they identify as, yeah, that's my family, but you know, they, they might not be biologically. So, so you've, you've told stories about your dad and his um, exit from the South. When you're telling that story, who are you telling that story about? And is it a true story of the person that you're telling it about? Yeah. Albert Wilkerson is is who that that story is about, mm -hmm. and he's amazing, mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. What about the stories of your birth origins? That you were born in a teepee, that you spent time living in South Africa, that because what you've said here, and I think it's an it's an interesting point, mm -hmm. that your racial identity becomes tied up with your credibility, right. and your credibility is tied up with your capacity to be an advocate. So absolutely. I'm asking these questions in part because I want you to be able to help us to understand the credibility part. Right. And so, and so some of that is, is, is just kind of gotten to be really um, stirred up in a, in a soup. So to clarify, mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so some of it has, has kind of been a little bit of creative nonfiction mm -hmm. um, with regards to what happened in sequence of events and dates and so forth. And I'm not sure, um, yeah, I've never seen pictures of Ruth Ann being pregnant with me and the, the birth certificate is a month and a half after I was actually born and yes they were living in a teepee and were building the house when I was actually born mm -hmm. um, and I actually remember where the you know the teepee was just like right 
mm -hmm. you know, next to the to the house or across the road from the house. Um, and yes, I had a recurve bow and, and Larry had a compound bow and there was hunting of all, you know, all this. Montana. So, right, in Montana. And so, and yes, they live. And so a lot of times when it's true that my family, meaning um, my th three younger siblings and um, Isaiah and Larry Than moved from Montana to Colorado to South Africa. And I went to undergrad school in Mississippi. And then I went to grad school in Howard. That's all true. That happens. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but then, you know, my family moved here and then did this. That doesn't necessarily mean I went each place with them through that whole process. And so, so yeah, it's, it's like yes and no on some things, but there's, I, I get the question of credibility, sure. right? And like I said, I will own that there have been a few interviews, especially after, um, having full custody of Isaiah, it became a little complicated. I have been having fights with people in my life about you, which is an odd thing. I don't, I don't know you except for, um, right. for the few moments that we've been talking, mm -hmm. um, having met Isaiah uh, briefly, um, right. and he's just an extraordinary young oh man. God, so proud of him. Um, but people saying to me, she's a con artist. Mm -hmm. Are you a con artist? I don't think so, you know? Um, I don't think anything that I have done with regards to the movement, my work, m my life, my identity, I mean, it's all been very thoughtful and careful. Sometimes decisions have been made for survival reasons or to protect people that I love. And all things included, mm -hmm. when it boils down, the entire world could say, stand down but when it comes to being there for my kids and my sister I will never stand down on that it's been hard for me to actually have the courage to be there for myself um, because my life and kind of my my path my journey has been to be so heavily aware of the needs of other people and trying to organize, strategize, and advocate for and protect those interests. And so at this point, I'm kind of thrust into, you know, are you gonna be there for yourself? Or are you not, are you going to um, back down, st you know, stand down, stand up, what's gonna happen? And I've really kind of taken the personal and the organizational, and in the last three days, <laughs> okay, here's family, here's, and WCP, police accountability, my students, all these things, my, my work, and here's my family, and here's my, and then there's me. Mm -hmm. And what is in the big picture interest? And so my resignation yesterday, I believe, I, I really came to see that, um, and that came from ultimately um, conversation with my oldest son, which, you know, he's just like, this is getting so out of hand. Like, Now's the time when, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you should say something. Mm -hmm. Like, this is, you know, and I, re and I really, as a local president, have to defer to regional, yep. national, within my, as I'm wearing that hat of the NAACP, I take mm -hmm. that very seriously by mm -hmm. protocol. Mm -hmm. And I feel so, you know, grateful and honored that the re state area conference president, the national president, really went to bat on Friday and said, we support her at, and her work in the NAACP. Um, that's, that, you know, that's so let me ask you the question that every black woman hates to be asked. What's up with your hair? <laughs> <laughs> right? So, um, right. Well, I'll talk to you about it. That's right, that's right. So, like... For me, for one of my producers, this was the moment. She was like, I can do, I can do all of this. I can stretch. I can try to think about racial identity in this more socially constructed way, but I cannot with the hair because hair goes to this, even if race is not biological, the experiences of being little black girls dealing with the physiological realities of the difficulty of black hair, man, they just, they feel like core pain. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about your hair, your hair choices, and also the ways in which you've you have talked and, and, and had a kind of discursive relationship with black hair. Yeah, well, 
my hair's journey, my hair journey has mm -hmm. been interesting. Um, certainly, I've gotten the, the whole TSA, you know, but there's so much of it. We have to search it, you know, <laughs> and the, whether, whether it's, you know, the, the twist out, the dreads. All right, whatever, so I, I got to right, pause. Right, I, I want right. more, but I want okay, you to stop right. on the TSA thing for just one <laughs> second because, because literally my producer said to me, and so I, I want you to address this. Right. She says, I, she says she every time that happens to her in the TSA and they're in her hair, oh she God. feels deeply, profoundly violated. Absolutely. And she said she probably likes it because it confirms her black racial identity. Hell no. Hell no. <laughs> no, I get your hands out of my hair. Okay. And no, like, I don't, you know, no, no. That's a, a personal violation. Mm -hmm. It's a privacy breach. Mm -hmm. No. Even if it confirms your blackness in some way. Which That's was her cross in my mind at that point. Yes. Would you describe what you're doing as passing? Hmm. You know, I think it's different than that. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know that I've had time to really <laughs> put into words uh, exactly what what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. But I think that in different, if I was to drop back into different moments of when I've either been identified, including by the police, mm -hmm. as black, white, and unidentifiable, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. all three, um, or, you know, I've identified as, um, you know, in certain moments, different, different ethnicities, but when, because I do hair, I do a lot of hair for actually black girls that are adopted into white families. Mm -hmm. And some, some of the girls that I have done hair for um, were actually at the point where they didn't even want to speak to anybody at school because they were so ashamed to be called a boy and all this kind of stuff. And I, I you know, in the grocery store, I'm like, excuse me, here's my card. I do black, you know, I do hair. And, you know, it, and if I'm, you know, it looks like I would get it because mm -hmm. from the third, it's just like, oh, of course, because she, you know, her hair, her hair. And so when I'm doing the hair and braiding, mm -hmm. I'm a braider yeah, yeah. Uh, right, at the yeah, end of the right. day, that's my, my main. But for a girl to smile for the first time, mm -hmm. to throw her braids and, you know, she was gone from like having her hair cut all the way off and just the, the trauma to, if I can do anything that's healing, even to one single person, All right, joining me now, MSNBC's own Melissa Harris-Perry. Um, well, I have a lot of thoughts. Uh, the first thought is you sat across from her, you interact with her, and, and there is this question of, like, what, what, what are we dealing with here? Like, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I have a PhD in political science, so unless you have a voting <laughs> problem, I don't, you don't want me to diagnose you. I'm that kind of, no, that kind of can, doctor. No, but you, you, can, yes. you can say as a, as a person interacting with right. another person who actually talks. Sure, yeah. So, so I, I guess what I would say is my experience of her, and, and I just want to be clear. We talked for about an hour. I right. had some conversation with her sons who are lovely. For me, when I meet um, the children of a parent and the children are, like, fantastic and lovely and smart and engaged, that always is going to give me a yeah. positive valence towards yes. their parents. Totally. And so I certainly had that. Um, and I didn't experience from her any malice of any kind. There were moments when I thought, okay, that's not how I see the world. But honestly, I have lots of conversations with many different people where I see the world quite differently than them. What I experienced from her more than anything was um, a deep sense of fami familiarity. And I think that for me is maybe part of why I've approached this story a little differently than some folks. So um, again, my mother's a white woman. She is from Spokane. Um, I get how one could be raised in a family with black siblings and have two white parents and yet not experience your whiteness in the way that you believe that other people are experiencing right. whiteness. Right. Because I have a sibling with two white parents who was raised in a household with black siblings whose experience of whiteness is, I don't think she would ever say she's black, right. but, but it's a different kind of whiteness. Okay, but that, that gets to the, the nub of the issue here, yep. I think, right? And, and, and part of it, I mean, what you said in, that, in the interview, there are people that are raged at you. There are people that are raged, there are people that are raged at her, there are people that are raged oh, at you. People are hot. They told me I gave not away. being sufficiently enraged they told, at her. They told me I gave away my daughter's blackness. And I was like, I'm sorry, how, what, how? Because I, I don't feel threatened by, by Rachel's um, crossing of the boundary, but part of what I've started to learn and understand is that, um, so I'm very disturbed by a lot of the things that we are reacting to in terms of this kind of biological, if you can't wave your black parent in a picture that I am not, you know, if, if you can't show me your one drop of black blood, you're not black. That disturbs me. Here's what I like. I am so invested in my black womanhood. 
I am so proud of the struggle and the joy and the hair and the self-expression that I, I am going to police this space because it matters to me. Mm -hmm. And so the more that I can see that policing not as a kind of narrow biological um, concern, but rather as a like, this is my space and you have to prove to me that you deserve okay, to be Okay, but there's also, the, the, to me, the, the, the issue, and again, I'm an yep. outside observer in a, in a certain sense in this, and uh, there's a certain sense of... Uh, like when you ask a con job, there's the, it, there's the deception. I mean, my read on this situation is, as we learn more about the background of this family, um, and this has now been reported, so I'm not, mm, you know, yeah. their, her brother is about to face trial uh, uh, with very serious allegations of, um, of child molestation. Yes. Uh, she has fallen out with her family. It appears over exactly whatever happened in that home. Yep. It strikes me that we're also dealing with someone who's got some very deep trauma around her family sure. that has kind of taken this emanation. Well, um, uh, sure, but I also think that the the idea that wanting to pass into blackness is in, is inherently crazy is something we need to question, uh -huh. right? And so, like, the idea that, oh, my gosh, only a crazy white woman would want to be black should distress us. So let, let me just say... <laughs> that's I mean, a fair, right, that's I mean, a fair point. Let, let, let fair me just point. say this. If like, I, you must be nuts because, because who would you want did to be this black? thing, right? Because who would want to be black? But let, let me just say this, Chris. If I can look at you and say, are you white? Right. And you're going to say to me, yes, and everyone will be in an agreement. Right. If I go and swab the inside of your mouth and right. send it off to Skip right. Gates and they find a drop of black blood, right. are, are you lying? And I guess the right. question for us is whether or not we think she's holding one set of beliefs about herself while saying another. And if you're asking, what did I experience across from her? It's not that. It's not that she's holding one belief about herself while expressing another. It's that she legitimately experiences herself as a black woman. The, can I ask you about the Howard thing? There, yep. you, you talked to her about it. We didn't. It, we didn't play it there. Yeah. Th that a lot of people. For a lot of people, that was the aha moment, right? It was like you. Yeah. You sued Howard because they were discriminating against you because you're white. This shows that you're essentially a hustler and a con artist. Yeah. Well, she might essentially be a hustler and a con artist. Right. Let me just say. Right. I, you I, don't. Right. Right. That's, that's, right. that's completely right. possible. Right. But let. But let me say this. What I heard her say. What she responded to me in the answer about Howard was really a gender discrimination case. And so my little married to a civil rights activist, you know, right. clicks in. And what I know is. Gender discrimination cases are way harder to demonstrate than racial discrimination cases. Particularly, we know that federal courts really like reverse um, racism discrimination right, cases. Right. So, if I am a woman with a um, who's pregnant with it, and and I am in a financially difficult situation, and I get an attorney, and the attorney says, "You know what? We're not going at this on gender, right, honey. Right. We're going to go out this in race." I, I don't know if that's what happened. I'm just saying. She's a bit of a roar shark test. If you look at her and you want to believe that she is a hustler, you will see a hustler. If you look at her and you want to see somebody struggling through the complexities of life that a lot of us struggle through, you might see that. Melissa Harris Perry, um, thank you for being here and thanks for the fantastic interview. Oh, sure. Great to see you. Thank you. I Good to you. see you. I miss you. Very, very nice. Hey, YouTube fans, I'm Luke Russert. Thanks for checking out our MSNBC channel. Subscribe by clicking right here and click any of the videos over here to watch the latest breaking news, mini documentaries, conversations from Shift, and other digital exclusives. Check it out.